Having served her time in prison, Dixie Shanahan has returned to her rural Iowa home. She declined to be interviewed for this program. For many others who are still suffering from abuse, we urge you to contact the National Domestic Violence Hotline. It's completely confidential, and they can help you find a way to safety. I'm Tamron Hall. Thank you for watching Someone They Knew. was the case that many said was virtually impossible to win. A celebrity suing for defamation in the United States of America, land of the First Amendment. Johnny Depp, an admitted drug user, accusing his ex, Amber Heard, of purposely lying about being abused by Depp and destroying his reputation and career. It was a trial which happened after Johnny lost a similar case against a tabloid in the UK. Ben Chu, lead attorney for Johnny's legal team, sat down with Court TV's Chanley Painter today. The verdict came in, our hearts were in our throats. We, we were hopeful, but not presumptuous. Tonight, we take a look at the entire interview as Ben Chu takes us behind the curtain, revealing what it was like to represent one of the most famous actors in the world. He looked to me and my team for that, and that was a great honor and privilege, and we knew that it was the most important case that Johnny had ever been involved with. And reacting to statements made by Amber's attorney after the $15 million verdict. That was almost more disappointing than her statement about evidence being kept out because I construed that as an affront to the jury. And now the interview with the winning attorney from the trial of this century, Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard. I'm Vinnie Politan. Great to have you with us tonight here on Closing Arguments. Uh, wow, what a show we have in store for you this hour. Uh, unbelievable insight that you will get. I wanted to start, though, um, when you're young, right, and, and you're thinking about, what do I want to be when I grow up? And, and for lots of us, we want to be, you know, maybe a rock star. That would be like a, a great career, right? Get up on stage, people screaming your name. Um, asking for your autograph, following you around, making tons of money, jetting around the world. Um, it'd be a great life, right? At least that's what you think, it would be a great life. You know, you want to be a rock star or whatever your rock star is. You know, you want to be famous, you want to be rich, all that sort of stuff. And then, you know, reality checks in and at a certain point in your life, you're like, okay, I get it. I can't sing. I'm never going to be a rock star. I mean... Um, I'd get booed off the stage during karaoke, for goodness sake. So, you know, you end up, maybe you go to law school, right? And you go to law school and, and you give up the dream, the original dream of being the rock star. And now you have new dreams, you know, things that you want to accomplish, you know, after going to law school. Maybe you want to be um, a great prosecutor or you want to be a judge someday or you just want to help get justice for people who, who need a voice. And, and that's admirable, obviously. And a great career. But you've given up that original dream of being the rock star. And for lawyers, you know, day in and day out, what do you do? I mean, you could be uh, just the greatest litigator in the world and, and be great at depositions and filing motions and making arguments in front of judges. And then at the end of the day, best case scenario, maybe like one of your colleagues was in the courtroom and says, hey, that was a great argument you made. Or the judge will give you a little nod or even your client will say, thanks, counselor, you really made a difference, right? That's, that's usually like the best you can do as a lawyer who's really good at their job, like really good at your job. And then this happened, right? Uh, Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard, and, and it was different. It was way different for Johnny Depp's legal team. I mean, you had to be there in Fairfax County, Virginia. I mean. Yeah, they were there screaming for Johnny Depp, obviously. That's been his life. He literally is a rock star and an actor, right? But his lawyers became stars, 
right? It, it happened on social media, the internet, but at the courthouse, that's where you really, really felt it. The excitement, the anticipation. I mean, people gathered outside the doors, the front door, just waiting for the moment that one of these lawyers, lawyers is gonna step outside so I can scream and cheer and, and, and say their name, maybe get a picture with them. Um, amazing, amazing. They became rock stars. And guess what happened? Chanley Painter and the rock star together today in the Big Apple, New York City. And we've got uh, that interview to play for you. But first, let's bring in our rock star, Court TV legal correspondent Chanley Painter, uh, joining us from New York, New York. Great to see you, Chanley. Um, uh, great job with the interview. I mean, the folks are going to see it in just a second. But um, how is Ben Chu handling this new rock star status that he has? <laughs> in the most humble way possible. What a nice guy. I mean, he's so affable and just congenial. He's approachable and he's just taking this in stride. He almost feels embarrassed at all the attention that he's been getting over the last several weeks. Vinny, uh, great to be with you. I am, yes, I am here in New York City. Now, Johnny Depp may be across the pond in the UK, but his attorneys are here in New York. So we had to come here in person to meet with them. And I was very excited to sit down with Ben Chi we were limited on the amount of time that we had with him. I didn't even get to three pages of my multiple page outline with him, Vinny, but what we did glean, such key insights behind the scenes, things our cameras may not have seen during the six, six week trial. And I can't wait for our viewers to watch it all. And it's so appropriate that you were timed, just like the lawyers were timed during the trial. You know, all right, you've got this much time to get it all in. So let's <laughs> jump right in. Let's take a look. Chanley Payne's are speaking with Ben Chu um, here uh, talking about, you know, getting involved with Johnny Depp and getting involved in the trial of this century. Let's take a look. We lived and breathed this trial for six weeks, but you, your legal team, lived and breathed th this trial for years. Uh, this was filed in 2019. You guys have been working. I looked through the court file. There are hundreds <laughs> of documents back and forth in this case file. So take us back a little bit to how you got involved in this case and how you maybe approached this trial because you were representing Johnny Depp. Well, I, I'd had the pleasure and honor of representing Johnny in a couple of other cases against his former manager and against his former attorney. So when this case came to be thought of, uh, he looked to me and my team for that, and that was a great honor and privilege. And we knew that it was the most important case that Johnny had ever been involved with. So we gave a lot of thought to the personnel we were going to bring to bear. And we assembled what I think is the best team our firm could muster. And we had people from our Orange County office, people from our New York office, people from our Boston office, and people from our office here in D.C. Uh, in DC. Right. Dozens, it's dozens of attorneys, a, the whole team, like an army, I think is what I called them, of attorneys. And Small army. <laughs> Small army. And you, and you delegated certain roles. Um, but this was a lot of unglamorous or unspectacular preparation, I think, in preparing for this case. Give us an idea, if you can, the amount of hours that your team put in. It was a massive amount of hours, and there were also, in the years leading up, and you're right, we filed it on March 1, 2019, um, Ms. Hurd's team had at least three sets of dispositive motions seeking dismissal of the claims on various legal grounds. So that was something we had to contend with. There was also a, a lot of discovery, a lot of document discovery, and, a lot, and many, many depositions. How involved was he in the preparation of this trial and the day-to-day -day of the testimony? Quite a bit. Um, he wanted to know exactly what we were doing, who we were speaking to. He had a lot, you know, without disclosing attorney-client privilege, he had a very heavy input. Into, into the strategy. He's, he's a super bright and thoughtful person. So it was very helpful to have a client so involved in the process. And both Johnny and Amber took the stand in this trial. Let's start with Johnny's testimony. How did you help him prepare for the days he was on the stand? Mostly it was Jessica Myers, who's a very talented attorney in our New York office. We tried to match up 
attorney with witness. And it was our collective thought that Jessica and Johnny were a good match. They're both very quick, they're very, very smart and diligent, and it really worked out well. So most of the preparation was one-on-one, -on -one, Jessica and Johnny, or with Camille or me. Um, we brought Wayne Dennison from our Boston office to come in and play the heavy, and um, a role he played very well. Great cross-examiner, by the way. Oh, uh, well, I think Wayne is the best. He's terrific. So he came in to play the part of Ben Rottenborn, cross-examiner, because we anticipated they would put a man on Johnny and try to get him riled up. So I think Johnny was well prepared. But as to the substance of his testimony, that was all Johnny. We, we of course, had suggestions, as you do with any witness, but the words were all his. On that cross, because there were moments that went viral from that cross-examination. Thank you. So I'll just, okay, I'll yeah. just stop talking. Um, thank you. I, I appreciate it. I want to be respectful of the court's problem, time and the, and the jury's time. Um, Sorry. I just said I want to be respectful of the court's time and the jury's time, and I, I trust that you do too. So, um, well, I don't feel you, like I'm wasting anyone's time, sir. Could you pull up Exhibit 408, please? And Ben Rottenborn really inundating the jury, everyone, with, like you've mentioned, these text messages, these audios, trying to paint a darker picture of the beloved movie star. What advice did you give him to handle that, to just agree, you know, with Rottenborn? What did you tell well, him? Well, we just told him to keep his cool, and he did. And I think since we, I think to some extent, hopefully we inoculated the jury a little bit of that. Were you watching the jury during this? Did you have any observations of how they took him in? We tried to be careful about that. We didn't want the jury to think that we were being overly intrusive. And they were hard to read when you did look at them. But I thought, and he's a, a very effective examiner, but I thought the repetition of bad texts didn't resonate that much because in none of those texts was there any uh, admission or suggestion that he had done any of these things. All right, folks, we're just getting started. Chanley Painter staying with us the whole hour. I want to get to this commercial quickly because we have so much more to show, folks, including Johnny being bad. How did he handle and deal with those text messages? Um, Chanley's asking all the right questions tonight. Let's take a look.
Jewelry with Worthy.com. You text Mr. Bettany, let's burn Amber, three exclamation points. You say, let's drown her before we burn her, three exclamation points. After you said, let's drown her before we burn her, Mr. Depp, you yeah. said, I will f her burnt corpse afterwards to make sure she is dead. That's what you said that you would do after you burned her and after you drowned her. Did I read that right? You certainly did, yes. Some difficult stuff that Johnny Depp had to deal with on the on the witness stand. How do you prepare for all that? Still with me, Court TV legal correspondent Chanley Painter, who spoke with the lead attorney from his team, Ben Chu, today. Um, that had to be a big part of what they had to do here because there was so much of this bad character kind of evidence directly related uh, and connected to Johnny Depp in his case. Absolutely. And I, I talked about that with Ben Chu. I said, was there a moment when you're going through discovery in this case, you're uh, conducting depositions that you turn to Johnny Depp and said, are you sure you want to go through with this, given what they knew the jury would hear and how Amber Heard's team would try to paint him on the witness stand as the abuser and whatnot. And, and he said, Yes, he did have that moment with Johnny Depp. And for Johnny, this was worth it because he had to get his truth out there. He had to do it for his children, whatever it took. He knew the risk about it and, and he wanted to go forward. And he did, like we played earlier, prepare with the team of attorneys. His time on the witness stand, he directed how he would tell his story. And it was so interesting to me, Vinny, to hear that Wayne Dennison, really one of the unsung heroes of Depp's team, the cross-examiner of most all of the experts brought forth, really did uh, hold Johnny Depp's feet to the fire, trying to prepare him for that cross, which they just told him just to keep his cool and be himself. Absolutely. All right, let's get back to Chanley's interview with Ben Chu. <laughs> So during the trial, there was a lot of unflattering, as kind of mentioned, exposure into Johnny and Amber's relationship. At any point, you know, when you're reading through the discovery that you mentioned or the depositions that you're conducting, did you think of asking Johnny, are you really sure this is what you want to do? We'd crossed that Rubicon before, and we, we knew that there were some unflattering texts, um, mostly done after the allegations were made by Ms. Heard. So we thought that those needed to be brought out affirmatively by our side and put into context. Uh, so we did that. I mean, we never tried to portray Mr. Depp as a saint. He's a man who owns his faults. We didn't want to hide those from the jury. He took ownership of his struggles with alcohol and drugs, and he took ownership of, of texts that were private texts never intended to be seen by the, by the world or by Ms. Heard in, in no way. Um, but he, he really took accountability for that and he thought about it very carefully before we filed the complaint. Okay, I'm running out of time, but I have to ask Amber Heard on the stand. Uh, she spent several days, she talked about really horrible allegations. Jury ultimately didn't believe her. Why do you think that is? I don't want to speculate. I think there was a contrast between Mr. Depp and Ms. Heard in terms of taking accountability. I think Mr. Depp took accountability and Ms. Heard, there seemed to be very few subjects on which she was willing to make any kind of concessions. And I think there may have been a credibility gap. Here, real quick, you went viral with your fist pump for Kate Moss. Take us back to that moment. What was going through your mind? When I heard Ms. Heard say that she punched Mr. Depp because she was afraid that he would push her sister Whitney down the stairs like he pushed Kate Moss. I lost my composure for a moment and did a fist bump because I knew that that was not going to be corroborated by Ms. Moss. And fortunately, Ms. Moss, who had never testified in any proceeding, came forward affirmatively to say that that was not the case. Johnny had never pushed her, had never hit her, had never kicked her. 
And how important was that testimony to your case, do you think? I thought it was very important because this is a case about credibility, and that went directly to credibility. Were there any turning points in this trial as you look back on it to say, oh, that was where really momentum turned our way? I thought there were three. I think one was the totality of Johnny's testimony, uh, the totality of Ms. Hurd's testimony, and then finally, in closing, when Camille and I had an opportunity to kind of recapitulate and put it all in context. The appeal. Uh, what can you tell us? The uh, Hertz team wants to appeal this case. Do you plan to fight it? Does Depp really want, you know, 8.35 million from her? As Johnny said in his testimony, and we said in closing, this is not about money for Johnny anyway. This is about restoring his reputation and getting his life back. So it's not about money. As far as the appeal, I have no idea what grounds they're going to allege, but we don't think that there are any viable basis for appeal. And, uh, and there is one judgment against Johnny, and that's appealable, if you if you wanted to. That would that would be to the extent there's no global resolution. That that's something that we'd have to consider. I have to talk about you and Camille Vasquez really skyrocketing into the spotlight. What has that been like to do it? <laughs> have you ever expected anything like that? I didn't expect anything like that. I don't think Camille did either, but she's handling it wonderfully and. Can you send our congratulations on to her for being promoted to partner? I will. And uh, is there anything else that you would like to say? Anything else that I haven't asked you that you want to make sure you say? No, we just wanted to thank you all and we wanted to thank the jury and the court and, for, and the court personnel for all the, all the work that they did and we're very appreciative. And Ms., Mr. Depp really wanted to thank everybody. Sure. And thank you for your time oh, again. Thank you. I appreciate it so much. I have like three more pages, but that's okay. We've got more of the interview. We're playing it in a little different order than it happened in real time, so we've got much more ahead this hour. Let me bring in our guest joining us tonight in New York, New York, nationally known psychotherapist, currently the host of Talking Live and the Bite Size podcast, Dr. Robbie Ludwig in Los Angeles, California, California family law litigator, TikTok lawyer, Lamar Mojda Hiazad. And make sure you check out her podcast on Spotify and Apple Podcasts, and you can check her out on TikTok at Lawyer Lamar. Also in L.A., Deputy Public Defender, L.A. County, Philip Dubay with us. Great to see everyone. Um, Dr. Robbie Ludwig, what do you think about being a lawyer like, you know, Ben Chu, great lawyer, but now all of a sudden celebrity slash rock star? How does that change his life? And what, what um, advice would you have for someone who, you know, at that point in your career, all of a sudden now everybody wants a piece of you? Yeah. So it's such a good question because in looking at Ben and his interview, it seems like he's kind of a, a, an introvert in many ways. And so right now he has an opportunity to decide how he wants to use this new profile that he has and what's important to him. So it sounds like he's mature. He has a great legal career. Uh, and I imagine he'll use it just to attract new great cases. Um, that's how I see him using it. I don't see him as wanting to have his own show. It's just not my impression. Yeah, L Lamar, you know, we don't expect this when we go to law school, right? We don't expect to walk out of a courthouse and have people screaming our names. It just doesn't happen to lawyers. Yes, you're so right. I mean, we're just a community of nerds that love the law. And it's been so nice to see that the world is also enjoying the law and finding inspiration in these attorneys and in the legal field in general. Let me ask you, uh, Philip Dubé, um, Ben Chu, where he is right now in his career, um, wh what do you think, how, how does it change his, his life? How does it change who you are when you go from being just a great lawyer to a famous great lawyer. Well, assuming he wants to stay in the law, he's going to be able to write his own ticket. And what it's going to do is draw future clients. He's going to make it rain, as we say in the civil industry. He is going to bring in the big bucks, bring in more business, more clients. He'll probably be made an equity partner and he'll make big bucks. And he can just sit back and start delegating the files to the associate attorneys and just tell them how to try cases as he's out there drumming up more business. He won't have to be hands-on anymore in the courtroom.
And oftentimes the lawyers who are in the trenches all day, they look forward to delegating and going into management so that they can mentor and groom some of the younger, more ambitious lawyers who have uh, you know, yet to be out there long enough to have the same experience that Ben had. So I actually celebrate his accomplishment. I think it's wonderful and I think the best is yet to come for him. Yeah. Living the dream, They're, you know, and, and, and you know, it, you don't expect it. You just don't. You do your job. You're good. You're good. You have clients. You have cases, but you never could ever plan for something like this. All right, guests staying with us. We've got more. Uh, Chanley Painter still going to be with us. We have more of her interview with Ben Chu coming up. Don't go anywhere. His reaction to the statements from Elaine Bredehoff, Amber Heard's attorney, what she said, and then Ben's reaction, you do not want to miss it. com.
We're asking you to finally hold this man responsible. He has never accepted responsibility for anything in his life. You've heard it this whole time. He hasn't admitted to anything. He's blamed everybody in the world, his agent, his manager, his lawyer, Amber, his friends, everybody. But he's never accepted responsibility for a thing he's done in his life. That was Amber Heard's attorney, Elaine Bredehoff, during her closing argument during the trial. Now, after the verdict came in, Elaine Bredehoff sat down for an interview with the Today Show, where she talked about Amber's reaction to the jury's decision. You know, one of the first things she said is, I am so sorry to all those women out there. This is a setback for all women in and outside the courtroom. And I, she feels it, and she feels the burden of that. In her interview with uh, Depp's attorney, Chanley Painter gave Benjamin Chu the opportunity to respond to some of the statements that Elaine Bredehoff made on the Today Show. I want to talk about uh, Heard's lead attorney, Elaine Bredehoff. She made some post-verdict interviews as well uh, last week. In fact, I was supposed to sit down with her. She had to cancel last minute, uh, something urgent in court. Uh, we haven't yet rescheduled, but that offer is obviously still out there for her. But I want to give you the opportunity to address some of the things that she did say uh, last week to the media. Uh, she claims that your team demonized uh, Amber Heard and suppressed evidence. What's your response? I think it's disappointing that she would say something like that with respect to suppression of evidence there was a lot more evidence that came in in fairfax county than ever came in in london and i i took that uh as not being complimentary of our judge who was a wonderful judge i i don't think i just think that's an improper characterization as far as demonization the cross-examination of misheard that was done i believe beautifully by camille vasquez was not intended to demonize her it really was predicated on her own words so the cross-examination was based on statements that misheard had made and presenting her with some audios that she herself had made and really asking for her explanation i don't think that's demonization i think that's cross-examination Right. She points to medical records, uh, text messages from Stephen Duders, things like that. Would that have made a difference? Can you enlighten us on? I don't believe any of the evidence that was excluded. And there was evidence excluded on both sides. And you're very familiar. There are rules of evidence that exactly. apply. Not everything comes in. Right. And suppression may not be the best word, too, that she uses, right? It's inadmissible because of hearsay or... They're it's not relevant. Or exactly. And I, I think that I think Her Honor, you know, played it right down the middle, was very consistent in her rulings. And I, I think it's an improper characterization and perhaps she just misspoke. Sure. OK, another thing, uh, Elaine said that this verdict is a huge setback for women uh, thinking about reporting domestic violence would send a message that they cannot win. What's your team's response? I think that's entirely untrue. And Mr. Depp would want people to come forward if they were victims of domestic abuse. So I don't think this is a setback at all for women or men who have been victimized by domestic abuse. And I think this is a, I think this is a victory for truth. I think that's, I, I, I don't think it's a setback at all. Elaine also pointed to the jury as possibly even being tainted by the masses of Amount of media, this was all over social media, as you probably know, and even blaming the cameras in the courtroom for possibly tainting this verdict. What do you think? That was almost more disappointing than her statement about evidence being kept out because I construed that as an affront to the jury. I mean, the jury took an oath, as you know, not to look at social media, and there's no basis that the jury violated their oath. And these are people, and you saw them every day, who gave up six weeks of their lives, of their work, of their family, to pay attention not only to the evidence that Mr. Depp put forward, but also to the evidence Ms. Herb put forward. And to cast a shadow on them, I think, was really unfortunate and, and disappointing. Yeah, there was a statement even recently that Herd's team released. I'm sure you've also read this, but I want to get your take. The spokesperson for Amber says it is 
As unseemly as it is unprofessional that Johnny Depp's legal team has chosen to do a victory lap for setting back decades of how women can be treated in the courtroom, what's next? A movie deal and merchandising. That was the latest statement. What's your response to that? The response to that was one day after the verdict, I believe it was one day after the verdict, Ms. Bredehoft appeared on national programs. Uh, to set forth Ms. Hurd's position. So this is a, a response to that. I want to bring back in Chanley Painter, Core TV legal correspondent in New York City tonight. Um, Chanley, did you get any feeling for what the nature of the relationship is between the two legal teams? Is the, I don't even know if they knew each other beforehand, but is it, is it bad blood or is it just, hey, we did battle and, and we move on? You know, I, I always have my eye out for inside the courtroom, maybe when the cameras aren't on, when the attorneys arrive in the morning during a recess. You can see them interacting in the courtroom. You can see them interacting in the hallway. Always professional. They do battle when the jury's in there, right? They each have their position they advocate for. But I'm noticing the attorneys um, greeting each other, uh, complimenting each other on what they're wearing, shaking hands. And that's important, I think, to carry that professionalism on and so even though they have polar opposite points of view that is important to carry with them and and, and how he even responded to that i mean uh, to johnny depp's team you know he is the domestic abuse survivor and his story is one that they hope sends a resounding message that inspires any victim man or woman to speak up live their truth fight for that truth and of course you have amber heard's team who advocates that she was actually the victim and the jury just didn't believe that version of the story that's right. Somebody won, somebody lost, and it was very clear at the end of the case. Uh, Challenge is going to stand by. I want to bring back in our guest, Dr. Robbie Ludwig, Lamore Mojdahiazad, and Philip Dubé still with us. Uh, Lamore, let me ask you, um, what did you think of, of Amber's response and Amber's team's response? Did it sound like sour grapes to you? It did a little bit, and last time I was here, I emphasized the the need to respect the court process and the outcome and to question the motives of the people who were tasked to come to this decision, I think is unprofessional and unhelpful. And I think that for someone whose complaint is that the decision was too heavily influenced by the court of public opinion, to bring those grievances to the court of public opinion is just a, a little bit too hypocritical for my taste. Yeah, Philip, what was your, your reaction to the response from uh, Amber Heard's side? I think it was wholly unnecessary. Now, I will say this, though, to be fair to Elaine Bredehoff, I actually really like her. I think she's a very classy lady, and she's doing whatever she can to represent the interests of her client. Um, I think what she was doing was not attacking the jury. She was not attacking the court. I think she was uh, voicing some of her disappointment with the rulings and obviously the outcome. And I think one of the issues, and it's a, a good issue, frankly, that will be raised on appeal, assuming Amber can get the funds together to post the bond to get into court on appeal, or if she has uh, an insurance defense company defending her, I don't know, they might exercise their rights to take the appeal. But there's going to be this uh, idea of what we call issue preclusion or collateral estoppel, meaning there were various issues of defamation that were already litigated in Britain. And both sides had a full and fair opportunity to litigate those issues. And because there was a final judgment, the resolution of those issues in favor of Amber Heard should have been imported into this case to preclude further litigation on the issue. We'll see what the court does. No, it we can't have a, a 71 year old man wearing a wig make these decisions about cases in the United States, Philip. That's crazy. No, the the issue is the issue. Was the issue decided where both sides had an opportunity to It was decided by a 71 litigate. year old judge. It's not by real people. Oh, we we, we the people. Me. We the people. We broke away from them years ago. I think it was like 1776. Don't get me wrong. I don't agree with that judge's decision. Okay. I actually think the judge was wrong. Don't get me wrong. But remember, if you're Elaine Braderhoff and you are advocating for your client, Amber Heard, you're going to look for every which way to reverse this judgment gotcha. on appeal. I got gotcha. you. And right? no, it was, it was yeah. a real issue they brought up. It's just, you know, 
come on. We, we, we got our own system here. We set it up. We've got our own constitution, a little bit better than theirs. Um, let me ask you, um, uh, Dr. Robbie Ludwig, they keep saying this is a setback for women, a setback for women. That's, um, you know, that's their perspective. I don't think the jury thought it was a setback for women. Yeah, I don't think it has to be a setback for women. There were a lot of abused men that felt very validated and liberated by this decision. Listen, you know, when, when women are victims of domestic abuse, what's most important is that they have a place to turn to. Usually the first place to turn to is not the court of law because they want to survive. So a support group or an organization or therapy is usually where they first tell their story. So I would hope it's not a setback for women. Um, you know, it just sounds like PR spin uh, that Amber was talking about. And I don't even believe that that was her first concern. I think with Amber, her first concern is always herself. And in part, that's what the jury responded to, a lack of awareness of what she did wrong. Um, even in the article, she just points the finger, blames, and doesn't talk about where she was wrong in this whole picture. So it's Amber's likability problem and credibility problem that was really the issue here. She is not all women, and all women are not her. Yeah, and the self-awareness is real because those post-verdict statements made by Amber Heard uh, potentially more defamatory than the Washington Post op-ed, and we'll see how that plays out. But um, I know our time was short tonight, but I appreciate you all coming on and, and helping us through this big, big night here on Closing Arguments. Dr. Robbie Ludwood, Lamore Mojdahiazad, and, of course, Philip Dubé. We'll see you again really, really soon. When we come back, we've got more, more from Chanley Painter's sit-down interview with Ben Chu. A little bit of the reaction to the verdict next. <laughs>
Time to get back to uh, the interview we were showing you. Chanley Painter sitting down with Ben Chu, Johnny Depp's lead attorney, here talking about the verdict. Uh, when the verdict came in, our hearts were in our throats. We, we were hopeful, but not presumptuous. So we were, we were really sweating it out. It took nearly 13 hours for the jury to reach this verdict. And as an attorney, I know that can be, you know, really anxiousness going through what you were thinking. Uh, can you take us to that moment? Were you, were you having any doubts in those hours of deliberations? We were, we were anxious, but we cut the anxiety by playing a ferocious game of Monopoly in our room. So that's, it distracted us sufficiently, but we were, we were still thinking about the verdict. Sure. And of course we had this false start, if you will. We're all gathered in the courtroom, it's almost three o'clock, and the jury didn't fill out the damages portion of the verdict form. When you find for a defamatory statement, um, one or more, you need to fill out the compensatory damages. It has to be at least a dollar for compensatory damages and up to whatever you feel the damages should be. And for punitive damages, you can put a zero there or you can fill out that as well, but I'd need those uh, lines filled out, okay? All right, so if I can have you retire back to the deliberation room and do that for me, okay? You guys approach the bench with the judge. What did she say in that moment? Did you know what was happening in that moment or what the verdict may have been? We didn't, and it, we were hoping that she might give us some clues, but she's played it straight down the line and said that the jury had reached a verdict on, as to one of the statements but had not filled out a damage and she was apprising counsel for both sides that, that her of her intent to orally instruct them to put in a damages number but we didn't know whether that was a statement on the counterclaim or one of the affirmative three step, uh, statements in Mr. Depp's case. But you knew someone had at least one a statement against the we other. Knew that Did you have some, a good feeling? Um, we didn't dare have a good feeling. We felt really good about how the evidence came in, and we thought Johnny did a magnificent job finally having his say. But uh, the jury was very hard, at least very hard for us to read. Out this verdict, this, it's a split verdict, right? I mean, an overwhelming win for your team. The jury clearly believing Johnny Depp's version of events, but they did also find at least one of those statements in the countersuit said by Adam Waldman, the attorney for Johnny Depp, was defamatory towards Amber Heard. How do you make sense of that? Well, I, I think it actually is consistent, and I would agree with your characterization. This is an overwhelming victory for Johnny as to all three of his statements, and as to two of the three statements at issue in the counterclaims in which Mr. Waldman characterized Ms. Hurd's claims as a hoax. I think that as to the one that the jury found liability on, it was a convoluted statement with a lot of moving pieces in it about what Amber's friends did on that particular night, May 21, 2006, uh, 2000, uh, yeah, 16. So uh, that was really very difficult to prove. So that was not a total surprise, nor do I think it was in any way inconsistent with what the jury did in affirming Johnny's claims and in knocking out the other two. Let's talk about Johnny. He wasn't there in the courtroom during the reading of the verdict. Should he have been there? He wanted to be there, uh, but he had a prior commitment with Jeff Beck, who's a close friend of his, to play in England. So he was he was torn, but he is a man who fulfills his obligations, and he had an obligation to uh, to Jeff Beck. But he made very clear in a statement, which you probably saw, that he this that he had profound respect for the court and for the jury and for all of you who spent so much time there in Fairfax County. So his not being there was in no way intended to be disrespectful, to the contrary. Right, and how did he find out being across the pond? I believe that he was in a pub watching it. And we weren't, obviously we couldn't share that moment with him, but we did FaceTime him and he, he looked like the weight of the world was off of his shoulders. And it, yeah. Tell us more about his reaction, and I see you becoming emotional. You became emotional during closings, too. Yeah. I mean, his life was on the line, so we felt very strongly, and we felt strongly that he 
did not do anything remotely like this. And we all felt that way or we wouldn't have been working on it. So. And I could see that every day. You know, I was there in the courtroom. I watched how you interacted with your client. You know, as an attorney, that's so important. You could see the bond that you have. He's a great guy. I mean, he, he's got a terrific sense of humor. And the fact that he could show that when the worst possible details about his life were being exhumed on an international stage. I mean, he knew when he had us file this case that there was going to be embarrassing, humiliating information about his personal life, mm -hmm. and yet he did this anyway. And it was because the charge against him, he felt was so heinous and something with which his children should not have to live. Right, and considering that, did you also have to sort of prep him for the worse as well in the outcome of this case? We, we did, and I think he was quite cognizant of that in light of what happened in London. And we went through a mediation, and the, you know, the mediator was candid about. Um, defamation cases, as you know, are very hard to prevail on, even under the best of circumstances. Um, so this, yeah, I think he went into it um, eyes wide open. You kind of took my next question. Was he aware of what a long shot this was? Because, like you said, the, the law for actual malice and defamation, especially from a plaintiff, is difficult. It's a high burden. It's a very high burden. I think he understood that. But I think he felt that he had no other choice but to try to get the truth out and to have his say. And I think irrespective of the verdict, I think he was pleased that he had a fair opportunity to be heard. So I think either way, I think he, he had the satisfaction of having his say. And uh, it's been about a week now. Have you talked to him recently? How's he doing? Um, he seems to be doing fine. He's quite busy. He's doing shows with Jeff Beck. And I think he's finally able to breathe. One of his friends said that he hasn't seen Johnny smile like this since 2016. Let me bring back in Court TV legal correspondent Chanley Painter, fresh off this interview. Chanley, uh, an amazing moment there. He got emotional, Ben Chu did. Yeah, he did, Vinny. Uh, he, I could tell that his his eyes were welling up with tears, and I, I just wanted to give him that moment to express what he was feeling. He was really reliving the verdict and what that meant for his client. You know, would you, if you think back to closing arguments, he actually became emotional when he was arguing those those final uh, tidbits to the jury about what this means to Johnny Depp, that he needs his life back. He's doing this for his children. And again, he had tears in his eyes, which really goes to show how invested he is in his client, how much he believes in Johnny Depp. Yes. And, you know, this was a civil case, you know, civil cases about generally damages, money, et cetera. Um, but it really brought home the point that this was uh, much, much more. And it was the kind of reaction we see sometimes with criminal attorneys who were literally have clients' lives in their hands. Absolutely. And, you know, this is some a relationship between Ben Chu and Johnny Depp that has been years in the making. He's represented Johnny in previous matters, litigation matters, and he's still representing him in a couple of other uh, legal matters moving forward. I did get to ask, you know, what is next for Johnny Depp? Everyone keeps asking what's next. And of course, he's going to keep himself busy playing music, but also he has a movie coming up in France, Vinny, later this year. All right, Chanley Painter, job well done, as always. Enjoy the Big Apple. Get a slice. Talk to you later. Think Tank next, their reaction to Chanley's interview. Don't go anywhere.
Join Calibrate.com. In New York City, the interview with the winning attorney from the trial of this century, the lawyer who shocked the world by winning a $15 million verdict in a celebrity defamation case. Johnny Depp's attorney, Ben Chu, talks to Court TV's Chanley Painter. This is an overwhelming victory for Johnny as to all three of his statements. Tonight, we learn what it was like behind the scenes in Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard. Meanwhile, in Orlando, Florida, the next live trial on Court TV, Michael Redlick marries his stepdaughter, Danielle, and ends up dead. But was it murder, self-defense, or a heart attack? Tonight, we take a closer look at Florida versus Danielle Redlick. He stabbed himself, and I ran into the bathroom, and then when I came out, I was trying to help him, and I thought he was lying in blood. And on the docket tonight in Fremont County, Idaho, the doomsday prophet Chad Daybell back in court getting ready for the biggest trial of 2023 as he and his wife, Lori Daybell, are facing murder charges after her children were found buried in his backyard. Plus, in Montgomery County, Maryland, a man arrested with burglary tools, a knife, and a gun outside of Supreme Court Justice Kavanaugh's home, who allegedly intended to murder the justice because he was upset by the leaked abortion case opinion and the school shooting in Texas. Tonight's 13th juror question, why is this happening? Get ready. This hour of closing arguments starts right now. Vinny Politan, thank you so much for joining us tonight here on Closing Arguments. Really a big night on Closing Arguments. Big interview today by Court TV legal correspondent Chanley Painter sitting down with the winning attorney from Depp v. Heard, Ben Chu, Johnny Depp's lead attorney, uh, meeting uh, with Chanley today in New York. We've got uh, some of that interview to go through. Uh, we played some of it for you already last hour. But we're going to get some more insight and reaction tonight from our think tank. Let's bring him in. Joining us tonight in Atlanta, Georgia, criminal defense attorney Eklund Mercy is with us and, and back with us. She's been gone for a couple of weeks. So if you don't mind, Eklund, I just want to let the folks know uh, why you've been gone for a couple of weeks. And uh, our thoughts are with you. I want to put up a picture. Um, this is Joseph Mercy, Eklund's dad. Um, amazing guy, amazing life. Um, yeah. Living the American dream, businessman, <laughs> entrepreneur, a go-getter, um, yes, and, and he passed away. Uh, and it's been a, a, a difficult, difficult time for the family because uh, he's so loved. But Eklund, we wanted to um, pay tribute to him and thank him for the, the, the wonderful legacy that he has left, uh, who joins us here on Closing Arguments, his daughter oh. Eklund. So... Eklund, great to have that you back. so much. That wow. means so much to me. Thank you so much, Vinny. I am, I've been rendered speechless. In fact, if you can ever, <laughs> if you could ever imagine, thank you so much. I know he would love it, and he would probably be like, I'm because I'm a big deal. Um, so <laughs> thank you so much. Um, and I know he would watch you. Well. He would watch you all the time here. Yes, uh, every all, the time. Time. All, all the time. All the time. All the time. Thank also, you so much. Absolutely, absolutely. Also with us in Los Angeles, California tonight, former federal prosecutor Nima Romani, and in Phoenix, Arizona, criminal defense attorney who represented Jody Arias and the author of the book series Trapped with Miss Arias, Kirk Nurmi is with us. Great to see everyone tonight. Um, let's begin. Let's, let's show you um, a piece of the interview, Chanley Painter with Ben Chu, the winning attorney in a defamation case representing a celebrity, I'm still shocked. I'm still shocked. Um, here he is talking about uh, what this victory meant. It's a split verdict, right? I mean, overwhelming win for your team. The jury clearly believing Johnny Depp's version of events, but they did also find at least one of those statements in the countersuit said by Adam Waldman, the attorney for Johnny Depp, was defamatory towards Amber Heard. How do you make sense of that? Well, I think it actually is consistent, and I would agree with your characterization. This is an overwhelming victory for Johnny as to all three of his statements and as to two of 
the three statements at issue in the counterclaims in which Mr. Waldman characterized Ms. Hurd's claims as a hoax. I think that as to the one that the jury found liability on, it was a convoluted statement with a lot of moving pieces in it about what Amber's friends did on that particular night, May 21, 2006, uh, 2000, uh, yeah, 16. So uh, that was really very difficult to prove. So that was not a total surprise, nor do I think it was in any way inconsistent with what the jury did in affirming Johnny's claims and in knocking out the other two. Okay, Eklund, I'll begin with you. What do you think? You know, the verdict, Amber Heard did win one of the claims, a lot less money, um, but was it a consistent verdict, do you think, from this jury? I think I think it was. I think it made sense. I think that um, had Amber Heard um, took in any type of responsibility for any of it, I think it would have been a different verdict, but... Um, the I, I don't think that she was advised correctly. I think that Johnny Depp's attorney were ready. They were ready. They were prepared. And they, you know, you can't sleep during trial. You have to be prepared. You have to go through the questions. And it doesn't seem that Amber Heard's team or that witness was very prepared. Uh, Nima, your, your thoughts about the, the nature of this verdict. I mean, you've got Ben Chu saying he sees it as being consistent. Other people have said... Wait a minute, how could she win one claim and he's winning claims if, if they're, you know, if they're alleging defamation against one another on the same issue? It is consistent, Vinny. And first of all, I want to say it's so glad to have Eklund back. I mean, we missed her. We loved her. And I know uh, we missed her father, but you raised an amazing, intelligent daughter. So turning to the verdict, if you look at the statement, if you drill down, Adam Waldman said that Amber and her friends perpetuated a hoax when they called LAPD that night. Well, Amber didn't call LAPD. Someone from New York did. And when LAPD showed up just a few blocks away from where I'm sitting, Amber didn't cooperate with them. So that statement was false. It was defamatory. And the jury did its job by actually kind of parsing through the statement there. So I agree with their verdict, and I think it was internally consistent. All right, Kirk, let me ask you a, a completely different question. Ben Chu now is living a life after a really big trial, like a really big trial that the world was watching. Um, your thoughts about his life from this point moving forward, having been through a relatively similar situation a few years back? Well, well let me first echo what Nima said and, and what a blessing it is to have Eklund back with us and we send my love to her and her, her family in this tough time. As for your question, Vinny, you know, it is really a strange kind of thing because you're in this trial, you know, in early other parts of the interview, he talks about there was going to be coverage, but they had no idea how big it was going to get. And I could certainly relate to that, right? And you're in this pressure cooker. You're on camera all the time, all day, every day. And then you're kind of kicked out and it's over. And it's a different kind of thing. It's a time of decompression. You could see the emotion when he was talking to Chandler. There's a time for decompression. And he had an entirely different situation that he was obviously connected to his client and believed in his client. So there's that kind of emotional release of, of that victory. So I think it's really going to be a period of adjustment for him and his entire team dealing with the kind of the notoriety, at least it's good notoriety on his part, and just to kind of adjust back to normal life. And I think that's what he's going to find himself doing over the next several months. All right, let's take a look at more of the interview. Um, you know, Elaine Bredehoff also did interviews. She sat down the Today Show. Um, and, and Chanley got uh, Benjamin Chu to respond to what she said uh, about uh, this verdict. Let's take a listen. Another thing, uh, Elaine said that this verdict is a huge setback for women. Uh, thinking about reporting domestic violence would send a message that they cannot win. What's your team's response? I think that's entirely untrue. And Mr. Depp would want people to come forward if they were victims of domestic abuse. So I don't think this is a setback at all for women or men who have been victimized by domestic abuse. And I think this is a, I think this is a victory for truth. I think that's... I, I don't think it's a setback at all. Nima, your thoughts. Is this in any way a setback, this verdict, for anyone? 
Well, there's two things. One, Elaine Bredehoff is a little bit of a sore loser, right? I mean, compare her statements to Ben Chu. You know, they're saying that Ben's doing a victory lap. I mean, he's not. He's been a professional throughout the trial during this interview with Chan Lee. And it's actually Heard's lawyers, the statements that they're saying, questioning the jury verdict, talking about appeal. Obviously, it's Heard's right to appeal, but she doesn't have a very good basis for appeal if you're talking about at least the arguments that Elaine gave during the Today Show. Now, with respect to, to setting the women's rights movement back, look, domestic violence, sexual assault, we all know those are two of the most underreported crimes in this country. I don't think that this verdict helped the movement. And in fact, it probably gave a roadmap to those who are accused to go after their accusers, especially when they have money, when their accusers don't. So it is going to have an impact. But ultimately, this was the just result. It was the right verdict in this case, regardless of what happens to other accusations throughout the country. Yeah, Kirk, you know, there's there's so many different ways to look at this trial and, and what it means. But uh, but Nima makes a great point that, hey, if you've been wrongly accused of something, now there's sort of um, new hope or new life in, in a way to respond to that if you've been wrongly accused. Right, and that's exactly the way it should be, Vinny. I kind of wonder, you know, we had this Me Too movement and the assumption was we were going to believe all accusers. And that sounds really good until it's someone that you care about, a man, your father, your brother, your son, et cetera. And now we see this blowback of Mr. Depp this this Mantu movement is kind of a correction, meaning that there's going to have to be cooperation. There's going to have to be evidence to advance that. And that presumption of innocence, that proof beyond a reasonable doubt, that's the way it should be. And that's the way it always been. There shouldn't be a need for a movement. The presumption of innocence is the movement that served this country well. So I don't understand what Ms. Brennerhoff is talking about. And I think what we see here in the Depp trial is kind of a, a correction to an overcorrection where we go back to that middle ground where we require proof and we hold people's feet to the fire should they make false allegations. Acklin, they're, you know, they're saying it's a setback for women, but you, you speak to women, it was overwhelmingly women who were not necessarily believing Amber Heard's testimony in this case. I mean, I see it every day on my Facebook page. <laughs> Um, because her testimony was not consistent. And um, I believe that what came out was that men can also be abused and men can also be the victims of domestic violence. And just the blowback from everybody um, when the evidence was presented that he was actually a victim is a problem. I don't think any anybody was set back. I think that people were able to see the truth truth of certain situations. Nothing is pretty. You're not going to get 100%, you know, of 100% the perfect defendant or the perfect plaintiff. But I but I just saw that, hey, we have a little bit more grace for men now. And now there's a space for men to really report if they're being abused. Let's go back to that interview. Um, and, you know, Johnny Depp had to testify here. Like, how do you get ready? Because Johnny Depp, you talk about some baggage. They knew all these things were going to come out, whether it was text messages, his drug use, et cetera. Let's listen. Both Johnny and Amber took the stand in this trial. Let's start with Johnny's testimony. How did you help him prepare for the days he was on the stand? Mostly it was Jessica Myers, who's a very talented attorney in our New York office. We tried to match up attorney with witness. And it was our collective thought that Jessica and Johnny were a good match. They're both very quick, they're very, very smart and diligent, and it really worked out well. So most of the preparation was one-on-one, -on -one, Jessica and Johnny, or with Camille or me. Um, we brought Wayne Dennison from our Boston office to come in and play the heavy, and um, a role he played very well. Great cross-examiner, by the way. Uh, well, I think Wayne is the best. He's terrific. So he came in to play the part of Ben Rottenborn, cross-examiner, because we anticipated they would put a man on Johnny and try to get him riled up. So I think Johnny was well prepared. But as to the substance of his testimony, that was all Johnny. Kirk, how important is that? Like, we, we see what lawyers do in the courtroom, but how important is it when you have a client who is going to take the stand and is going to be cross-examined? 
Um, how, would, how would you weigh that versus the work that's done inside the courtroom? Yeah, well, ultimately, you have to prepare your client as best you can for that moment on the stand. If you're going to think they're going to take the stand, you have to prepare them as best you could. And it sounds like Mr. Chu and his team did exactly that. You want to cross-examine them. You want to confront them with some of the evidence so that they can, in fact, get used to it, to understand the tricks that might be used. And we did see good cross-examination of Mr. Depp. Some of it, I think Mr. Chu pointed out in the interview, was irrelevant, you know, trying to just degrade him. But having him prepared for that so that he could react in a calm manner was probably the most important thing that they did in this trial because it was his testimony, I believe, that really won the trial for Team Depp. Yeah, and for someone like Johnny Depp, I don't think you're used to people talking to you like that, right? If you're this big star for decades, I mean, generally people in your life don't question you, cross-examine you, you know, try to pin you down. So it's a whole different experience for him. Uh, let's take a listen to, to more now. And this is another interesting part of this, uh, talking about, um, you know, Johnny Depp and sort of that relationship with uh, Benjamin Chu. He's a great guy. I mean, he, he's got a terrific sense of humor. And the fact that he could show that when the worst possible details about his life were being exhumed on an international stage. I mean, he knew when he had us file this case that there was going to be embarrassing, humiliating information about his personal life, mm -hmm. and yet he did this anyway. And, and that gets us back to square one when we first started covering this case, Eklund, which is like, why is he doing this? And it's up to the attorneys, right? You've got to sit your client down and let them know exactly everything that could possibly happen, everything that could possibly come out. And they had that conversation, Eklund, and they still yeah. went forward. Yeah, like when you have that come to Jesus conversation with your client, hey, you can either, especially this is a civil case, we can be bankrupt. You can be bankrupt. I'm going to go home paid, but you may not. And it, it, it's very serious, but I have to just commend um, Johnny Depp's team because there was no ego in the room. Everybody played their position. He, he made an audit of everybody's strengths and then compared it to each witness. It was brilliantly done. And then to also add um, just how much prepared. Johnny Depp was on the stand for days. This is not normal for one witness to be on the stand for days. And that meant that there had to be so much preparation um, and he did excellent. He did a lovely job. So um, the the team did an amazing job. It was just beautiful. Yeah, but beautiful. Eklund, Eklund, as you're saying, he was on the stand for days. Kirk is down there saying, what, what, four yeah. days? That's nothing. Try yeah. like 17 days. Try 17 days, <laughs> then talk to me. All right. Without it, a man. body, without a body. <laughs> All right. Eklund, Kirk, Nima, all staying with us the, the whole hour. When we come back, we're going to talk about uh, the next live trial on Court TV. We expect everything to start up tomorrow, right here on your front row seat to justice, involving a man who married his stepdaughter and ended up dead. Whew. More details when we return.
to four. I believe my husband is deceased. I, I just, he's stiff and he's, he's wounded. He might have had a heart attack. And he would say, as long as I can lock the knives up, I'm okay. The whole neighborhood knows that everybody, you know, they, they, were, they fought. Uh, What's the content of the text message? They are discussions between um, the parties concerning, at least in part, um, Mr. Redlick's um, displeasure and how he is reacting to some of the things that are going on in the home at that moment. Are you okay? Just sitting on my bum, crying my eyes. All I can think about is the kids. The next live trial here on Court TV out of Orlando, Florida. You've got a woman accused of murdering her husband. Uh, you take a look at their relationship, how it all began. It all began because he was her stepfather and his wife passed away and he ended up marrying his stepdaughter. He ends up dead and then there's this wild 911 call. Um, Julie Janae is down in Orlando, Florida and has a, a look at what's happening at the courthouse and how close we are to starting this trial. After three days of jury selection here in the Orange County, Florida courthouse, the court has seated a jury panel in the case against Danielle Redlick. It's a panel that's a little bit smaller than we're used to, and it's one that's overwhelmingly male. Here's a breakdown of the men and women who are going to be hearing the evidence in this case. There's six jurors and two alternates. In Florida, a six-member jury can hear a non-capital case if those parties agree. Two of those jurors are women and all of the rest are men, including those two alternates. Most appear to be in their 30s, and at least two of them are married based on their responses during jury selection. One of them is an elementary school teacher. And tomorrow, those men and women are going to hear a completely different set of events. This prosecution is going to allege that Danielle was the aggressor in this marriage and that she intentionally stabbed her husband, that she was a repeatedly abusive person towards my Michael Redlick, and they'll bring in neighbors like this one to corroborate. When it's physical, um, what have you seen? Mm, her slapping him around in the face. Okay. That was a neighbor who lives a few houses over from the Red Licks. Prosecutors also say that the couple's children witnessed their mother's aggression towards their father. But when they take the stand, which is undoubtedly going to be incredibly difficult testimony to sit and see their mother there at the defense table, the defense wants to ask them about text messages, ones that Danielle sent to her 15-year-old that they say show a different side to the abuse that was happening in that house. Now, here's one where Danielle is saying to her 15-year-old, I need to get out of here. He's being violent, talking about her husband. The child responds saying, I love you so much, mom. Are you okay? Danielle says he's heavy on liquor and the child says I flushed a lot of it down the toilet but don't be mad at me he doesn't know there's only a little bit left now Danielle saying she's not mad that that was a smart thing to do those text messages go on to say that Danielle was so in fear of her safety in that time period that she actually left the house that she had to get out of there and didn't come back until she believed her husband was asleep the judge has not yet ruled on the admissibility of those text messages during this trial. Reporting in downtown Orlando, Julia Janae with Court TV. A lot of familiar themes I'm hearing here, right? You've got um, a husband who's drinking. You've got a wife who's much younger. You've got allegations that she's the abusive one in the relationship. Sounds familiar to me. Let's bring back in the think tank, Eklund Mercy, Nima Romani, Kirk Nermi with us. Uh, Nima, what are your thoughts about the, the, the themes running through this or something we just lived through in the last two months in, in Virginia? We've got a, a dysfunctional relationship, only here um, you have worst case scenario, one of them is dead. If any, the former prosecutor in me is getting anxiety about another Florida self-defense case. You know, Trayvon Martin, we just covered Curtis Reed, not guilty because of popcorn or a cell phone, and now you got a sympathetic 
female defendant, right? We won't talk about that other female case that was uh, not guilty there in Florida. This is going to be a tough case for the prosecution. So, you know, sometimes court TV, we cover these cases. We call it a slam dunk or layup or whatever. This could go either way, especially if you have the kids testifying on behalf of mom. This is one folks should watch because it could easily be a not guilty here, Vinny. Yeah, Kirk, you know, you, you listen to that 911 call. She's saying heart attack. She's saying he's stabbing himself. And now we get to trial, and it looks like she's going to say self-defense. Um, from my experience, it seems like sometimes those things that are said beforehand kind of get washed away. You know, when you're in, when you're in the trial and, and the focus is so much on what the defense is, what are your thoughts uh, uh, going into this one? Yeah, I would say I'm not as worried as Nima is regarding the result here, because keep in mind here, this defendant is going to come across, I believe, as very unlikable, right? Because she comes with the story, the heart attack, and then he stabbed himself apparently multiple times, right? I don't know how somebody could do that. And then as a coup de grace, she goes to sleep for 11 hours, right? So before she calls 911, that's going to put her in a very unlikable position that is going to be tough to drag out of because to get for her to get out of. And keep in mind, too, this idea of self defense, she's this is her at least third version of the story, right? What she's probably told her attorney. That contrast is going to be looked upon with a great deal of skepticism, and I don't think she's going to be very well liked. So I think it's going to be really hard for her when she takes that stand to face all that down and really with any credibility in front of the jury in the kind of credibility that would be required to get a not guilty verdict. Okay, Eklund, let me get back to where I started this whole thing, which is the nature of their relationship and, and how they mm -hmm. met and how this romance began. And, and yeah, they were married and they raised a family, all of that. But at the end of the day, he was her stepfather. What does the jury do with that fact? Is it just like, um, you know, a distraction or, or will it be something that could impact the way they see this relationship? It will actually, it, it actually uh, hurts her because it's like she's younger. So the idea that um, she's a stepdaughter, it, it, it can be uh, construed as she's impulsive, she's young. You can see now that she doesn't have the red color in her hair. We're letting the white bang show to just show um, some type of maturity. But I don't think it helps her at all. I think that it actually hurts her. Nima, what are your thoughts about that fact in this case? Do, do you think the jury takes it into consideration in trying to figure out the nature of the relationship, who the abuser is, who the victim is, who's the one that is, that is the aggressor? I think it's very important. And if, you know, Michael really married his stepdaughter, that's going to make him not likable. Of course, the prosecution is going to argue that he did it for a noble reason. He married Danielle's mom to get her health insurance because she was terminally ill with cancer. So that's the story I expect the state to put on about the whole stepdaughter relationship. But, I mean, that's creepy, Vinny. So if your victim is, you know, having a relationship with his stepdaughter, that's not something that any prosecutor wants to deal with in terms of prosecuting the alleged defendant here. Okay, we've got more to get to. When we come back, uh, speaking of strange relationships, the doomsday couple, Chad Daybell, the, the prophet, back in court today. We'll get you ready for what will be the biggest trial of 2023. Chad Daybell and Lori Fallow Daybell.
Online. It's just so hard to know where the truth ends and then fiction begins. New developments in the case of Doomsday Cult mom Lori Vallow and her husband Chad Daybell. Now authorities are still searching for Vallow's children. How does she pose a threat to your children? I don't know what she's going to do with them. Think about all the people that had to die and disappear. Tell us where the kids are. Nothing is coincidental. This stretch is just so beyond what anyone could imagine. Investigators have recovered human remains at Chad Daybell's residence. There's no way, Morgan, I can ever come up with this. This is no longer the search for missing children. This is the search for killers. All eyes on this Idaho trial. Lori was his follower. Chad Daybell's the prophet. Chad had a vision. Plagues and foreign troops coming to the soil. It's the doomsday couple. Chad and Lori Daybell on trial. On the docket tonight, the doomsday couple, uh, this is a case with so many different layers and, and facts, very complicated case. When we first came across it, it took months to try to understand what happened here and what the allegations are. We're seeing it all play out. But right now, what I want to do is break it down uh, with a timeline of events so you get a better idea of what will be, trust me, the biggest trial of 2023. Here's Chanley Painter. September 1st, 2019. Lori Vallow Daybell and her brother Alex Cox move from Arizona to Rexburg, Idaho with Lori's children, JJ and Tylee. Rexburg is just a few miles from Salem, Idaho, the home of Chad Daybell, her future husband and co-defendant on charges related to her children's disappearances. September 8th. Lori, Alex, JJ, and Tylee go to Yellowstone National Park for the day. Police say this picture is the last verifiable sighting of Tylee alive. Lori had told friend Melanie Gibb that Tylee is taking classes at BYU-Idaho, but records confirm Tylee was never enrolled. September 19th. Melanie Gibb and her boyfriend visit Lori for the weekend. Lori tells Gibb that JJ has become a zombie. Gibb later tells police nothing seems unusual about his behavior. This is the courtyard where JJ is seen on camera playing with neighborhood kids. But in September, according to police, the children would go missing. September 22nd, the last verifiable sighting of JJ by Melanie Gibb and her boyfriend in Lori's home. November 5th, Lori and Chad tie the knot in Hawaii. November 26th, Rexburg police get involved with the search for the kids at the request of police in Gilbert, Arizona. Rexburg police knocked on this door conducting a welfare check requested by JJ Vallow's grandparents. Lori told police that JJ was with a friend in Arizona. But when that story didn't check out, the police returned the next day with a search warrant, only to find Lori and her new husband Chad Daybell were nowhere to be found. December 20th, while Lori and Chad are back in Hawaii, Rexburg police announced JJ and Tylee are officially missing. January 3rd, 2020, authorities execute a search warrant on Chad Daybell's property. March 6th, Lori has her first court appearance in Rexburg on felony desertion charges after being arrested in Hawaii. June 9th, Police and the FBI return to Daybell's property and discover human remains in a field behind the home. Later, Chad Daybell is arrested and charged with felony counts of destruction or concealment of evidence. June 13th, authorities confirm the remains belong to JJ and Tylee. Now, both Chad Daybell and Lori Daybell will be on trial together. Let's bring back in the think tank, Eklund Mercy, Nima Romani, Kirk Nurmi. Um, Kirk, we're expecting this trial to take about three months at least. Um, it's, it's a complicated story. It's a bizarre story. Um, what are your thoughts about a jury sitting in the box and, and understanding everything that's happening here and how bizarre all of this is? Well, you know, that's going to be the key for the state of Idaho, Vinny, to weave all this information into a, 
a, a narrative that can sell with the jury that they can filter through all this information because, you know, we have dead children. We have, uh, you know, her husband has passed away. We have all these different events, right? But they're going to have to provide a filter through so the jury can take a look at everything and condense it down so there's a story. Because with so many disparate parts and so many different things happening, and probably what's going to be a very bizarre defense with the doomsday prophet and his wife, they're going to be throwing different things out there regarding their prophecies, one would have to imagine. So the state is going to have to condense it down into simple terms so which the jury can filter all the information they have. And hopefully with that, that will lead to conviction. Hey, what, what's your biggest concern for prosecutors in this case, Nima? Really just an issue on appeal. I mean, it's such an overwhelmingly strong case, right? So you're looking at the appellate issues, you know, publicity, getting it moved, you know, to some other part of the state, the severance issue, right? Because ultimately, you got two dead children in the backyard. You have two crazy people uh, who, and multiple other dead bodies, right? An ex-spouse, a brother. So I think the jury is going to return a guilty verdict. I mean, it's going to be, talk about significant pressure to do so. There's going to be overwhelming pressure. Everyone in the world has been waiting for this trial and waiting for January. So I just want to make sure there's not a legal issue that comes up, whether it relates to competency, severance, uh, publicity, some other issue that's just going to make this verdict not stand because ultimately we're really marching toward this death penalty here, Vinny. Eklund Mercy, you've got both defendants will be there. What What is the dynamic here with the defense teams or the defense attorneys for both? Are they talking to each other? Do they do they have to agree? Do they agree beforehand like this is a unified defense or is it like each man and woman for themselves? How, how does that play out in the real world when there are co-defendants and in this case co-defendants who are husband and wife? Oh, it's the Hunger Games. It is the Hunger Games because you, you're, you're playing chess. You have no idea. Um, you think that they're helpful, but you're not sure. Um, they're trying to be on level footing. There's some there's some evidence that may help both of them, but at the end of the day, you represent your clients. So it is absolutely dog eat dog. Um, there is no love loss. That privilege has been thrown out the window because um, it's a criminal matter now. So it's it's going to be very interesting to see how who's going to hit first. I think that the person who comes up with the best story of what happened to these children are the ones that will be spared the most. Kirk, what are your thoughts about either one of them taking the witness stand? On the one hand, you've got Chad Daybell. He's the prophet. He's the one who was mesmerizing a whole bunch of people. And on the other hand, you've got Lori Valadaybell, who's able to, like every few years, convince another man to walk down the aisle with her. Um, what, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I could very easily see Mr. Daybell taking the stand for the reasons you just mentioned. He finds himself as charismatic, charismatic. He convinced people of his righteousness. And I think one of the fears is, especially when we're talking about the death penalty and all those things, is that he's going to use this as a forum to make himself a martyr for his beliefs. So I could not see him resisting the temptation to sit in front of all those cameras and share his beliefs. And quite frankly, if if they if Miss Vallow stays consistent, I think she, I could very well see her do the same thing because I think they're more concerned concerned about a guilty verdict than the death penalty because given their beliefs, they may welcome death rather than life in prison. So I think their entire focus is going to be on the guilty, not guilty phase, and they are not going to personally care as much about the death penalty. All right. Take a look, folks. We have a trial date. It's 2023, but early 2023, January 9th. We come off the holiday season. We get rested up and then boom, January 9th, and we expect this one again to go about three months or so out there in Idaho. When we come back, um, an actual legitimate real threat on the life of one of our Supreme Court justices it was my 13th juror question, like wh what is happening here? Why is this happening? Um, your thoughts when we come back.
Prepare for free at thezebra.com now. Brett M. Kavanaugh, do solemnly swear. I, Brett M. Kavanaugh, do solemnly swear. That I will administer justice without respect to persons. That I will administer justice without respect to persons. And do equal right to the poor and to the rich. And do equal right to the poor and to the rich. <laughs> and that I will faithfully and impartially. And that I will faithfully and impartially discharge and perform. Discharge and perform. All the duties incumbent upon me, all the duties incumbent upon me, as Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States, as Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States, under the Constitution and laws of the United States, under the Constitution and laws of the United States. So help me God. So help me God. That was Justice Kavanaugh being sworn in as a member of the Supreme Court of the United States. That's a lifetime appointment. That is it. Once you're in, you are in until you want to be out or, you know. Anyhow, speaking of that other alternative way that you're no longer in the Supreme Court, like if you're murdered, and we wouldn't think about that, right? You think, like, who, who's going to kill a Supreme Court justice? It's, it's absurd. We've never had these discussions before. But it's real. There was a real threat, someone was arrested. Let me read for you the FBI affidavit that was filed Wednesday. Um, Nicholas John Roski indicated, this is the, the suspect, indicated that he believed the justice that he intended to kill would side with Second Amendment decisions that would loosen gun control laws, the FBI wrote. Roski stated that he began thinking about how to give his life a purpose and decided he would kill the Supreme Court justice after breaking into his home. He then planned to kill himself as well, according to this affidavit. Unbelievable that this is actually happening and we're talking about it. Anyhow, I, I posted all this information, um, 13th juror comment of the day, and we begin with uh, Sue tonight who says, and I asked the question, why is this happening? And Sue says, our country is so divided when we have our own elected officials taking very serious very emotional issues and doing nothing that doesn't fit their personal agenda. Then we have our extremists that feel they have no choice but to take the law into their own hands and eliminate those who they feel are a threat to their idealism, uh, political and religious zealous. Uh, time is not healing our country's division. It's getting worse. Eklund Mercy, why is this happening? Well, I believe power without justice is merely violence. And I think that people are feeling are feeling that the people at power are not showing justice. They do not feel like their voices are being heard. And I mean, although I, I understand that people's frustration is just the timing of the threat and the just explanation on the specific <laughs> documents that were leaked just kind of seemed real convenient to me. So I, I don't know. I want to see more evidence to see if it's an actual, you know, situation or if it was just planted or planned. So, I mean, with the times being what they are and we still don't have real um, convictions on January 6th, I don't know what to think. Yeah, well, according to the FBI, he had with him um, a gun, a knife, burglary tools, duct tape, everything. Here's what Diane says uh, tonight. I think it's possibly a twofold cause. So many people with mental illness able to play out their demons randomly, and it could be the fallout from watching the protests in the last few years and saw a certain freedom of access without repercussions. Over time, they become bold enough to act. Just an opinion. Nima Romani, former federal prosecutor, um, why is this happening? Why are we sitting here tonight and we're talking about someone who was outside in the neighborhood of a Supreme Court justice with a gun, with a knife, and with burglary tools? It's a big problem. Credit to the marshals. We don't see them because there's no cameras in federal court, but those are those good-looking men and women who are wearing suits protecting federal judges. I think there's two reasons. One is the extreme 
politicization of America. You have the politicians, you have folks living in certain areas, you have gerrymandered districts. So instead of having moderates that win elections, you have these real kind of folks on the extreme on both sides. And the other reason is social media. People are going down these rabbit holes on both sides, getting news from social media, following these conspiracy theories. So yeah, folks went on January 6th on one side, but this is a guy who was here from Simi Valley in LA on the other side, trying to kill a Supreme Court justice. All right. Um, Kirk, unfortunately, we're out of time, but uh, you can post a comment on our 13th shirt, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, great to see you, everyone. Eklund, again, great to have you back with us. Nima Romani, Kirk Nurmi, always appreciate your time, your insight, uh, and expertise. Uh, we've got more to get to, though, folks. When we come back, uh, we've got a missing child, and we need your help. Stakes.
Welcome back. Before we go tonight, I have a photo I need to show you. Uh, please take a look. Study this photo. This is uh, Edisee Rocca, missing, just 12 years old from Fort Myers, Florida, since May 23rd of this year. If you see Edisee, please, please call 1-800-THE-LOST, or you can call the Fort Myers Police Department phone number right down here. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Vinny Politan. As always, have a great night. Please don't forget. This program is based upon a true story and contains reenactments. Portions of this program may be disturbing to audience members. Viewer discretion is advised. Up next, a bullet-riddled car, a missing driver, and no witnesses. It would seem she was still alive when she was removed from the car. Who would do such a thing like this on a public roadway? Was it an ambush? 